So geopolitical cycles, 2022, uh, what's going to happen? So the reason we're looking at this is, uh, first of all, we're fascinating what's going on with geopolitics, but also they do have the potential to impact markets. These are all mathematical cycles and really based on the uh, repetition of historic events. I want to start off uh, and state right at the beginning, our position is one of being objective, apolitical. Um, so we're neutral in this. We're observers of what's going on because some of this presentation might create some emotive views. And we're really just looking at everything from a cycle's perspective. Now, 2022 is somewhat different to the previous years. Uh, the, fun the geopolitics of this year are very much a function of the last few years, and I'll explain that in a minute. And uh, so what we're going to do is just dive back and look at the key points that have arisen from the last uh, few years. And then you can see why we are where we're at. Uh, and in so doing, we'll see the key cycle patterns. So why? Well, all of us, especially here at the uh, Foundation for the Study of Cycles, we're absolutely, you know, Edward Dewey's behavior, it's every uh, work all shows that human behavior moves in cycles, events recur in patterns, and therefore, to some extent, they can be forecast. And, you know, that is really what we are uh, looking at trying to achieve is some sort of degree of predictability. So first of all, let's head back then to 2016, 2017. And I, I recognize a lot of the names on the list and uh, some of you will have seen some of this. So stay with it because I've added more to it as well. Uh, but let's let's look at the very big picture. And uh, this is what uh, we put out in 2016. And uh, basically the, the idea was that we were entering a modern day revolution. And this is the pattern behind revolution. So basically, you know, Britain here uh, is uh, seeing Brexit in America. President Trump's on the, uh, you know, well, Trump is running, becomes president. And this is all change, all change in the world. We go back one cycle, it's roughly 82 to 84 years. Uh, Bill, yesterday, Bill Sarubi touched on this. And, uh, you know, it's very clear that this pattern, this is a pattern we're going to be working uh, a lot with. And it's, it's an approximate 82 to 83, 84 years. So we have to give it a year's tolerance each way. But you can see it comes in and then we head back one cycle previously, and we see that in 1933, Adolf Hitler becomes chancellor because Germany has been through great reparations since the Great War finished in 1918. And people are becoming dissatisfied. We can go back another cycle set, and it takes us to actually 1848. Karl Marx and his friend Frederick Engels published the Communist Manifesto. Basically, it's all about workers rise up, break free off your chains. Why? Well, we've moved into the Industrial Revolution and it's all about the rich. We're getting super rich. The industrialists were taking people off agricultural land and putting them into factories and possibly exploiting them. So there was this huge division between rich and poor. Are we seeing something similar like that right now? And we can take this cycle one further cycle back and we get to the American Revolution, actually we get specifically to the Stamp Act, which is really what triggered the, uh, the American Revolution. So the key point is that we are actually in a revolutionary time period right now. And if we take this time period that we're really in this current revolutionary period, arguably it started since the global financial crisis, but certainly the back end of, uh, of the um, uh, you know, from 2016 onwards, the back end of the last decade and into this decade, we're in the thick of it. And this here is effectively a 250 year cycle from here. So th three lots of the 82 to 84 work out at 250. So this is another cycle in itself. Uh, and we can project that one cycle back. And this was first presented in 2016, 2017. And if we go back to the 31st of October, uh, 1517, Martin Luther nailed um, his 95 theses to the church door in Wittenberg, challenging the Pope and starting the Protestant Reformation. So you can see these are big events in the world. It's all about people being dissatisfied with the status quo and they all want change. And that's exactly where we are right now. So we can you know, put this all together. Here's the 250 year cycle from Martin Luther, the American Revolution, 
over to Trump and Brexit, and, and the same will happen into the future. So this is putting it all in context and putting together the 250 year cycle and the 84 year cycle. So I want to familiarize yourself with these cycles because we're going to look at these in a lot more detail. And before I move on from this, I just want to show you some uh, deeper research into these cycles. Uh, we, we, we won't go into too much detail here, but there are um, uh, harmonics. Uh, so uh, it was brought up by uh, one of the uh, delegates about why the midpoint or uh, and uh, Lars was saying, as Dewey said, you know, we look at the thirds, we look at the halves, etc. And you see some really interesting things. 1793, there was 1792, the French Revolution, following on from the American Revolution, huge, you know, changed Europe. Uh, I think I'll just pick this one here. 1961, the Berlin Wall went up. 1989, the Berlin Wall came down. But this is the point that I really want to make is that we have got uh, effectively a, a whole series of revolutionary cycles coming together and we are living in it. It's a once in a lifetime uh, event or series of events that's happening. So that was 2016, 2017. Yesterday, uh, somebody asked about pandemics. And uh, one of the things that we warned our followers in 2018 was that to expect a pandemic. Why? Quite simply, because uh, we see, well, first of all, let's go back to the Spanish flu pandemic, 1918 to 1920. This was uh, um, a really, uh, uh, you know, a big event post First World War. Why was it called Spanish flu? Well, Spain was neutral during the war and it was the only country that was reporting it. And the influenza actually started in America amongst the US troops. But um, when I did research into this uh, several years back, what I found was that there was a cholera pandemic, 1817 to 1824, over seven years, starting in Asia and India, spreading across Europe and literally killing millions. And this is known as the first cholera pandemic. Move this back another hundred years, 1717 sees a measles pandemic in North America. And we can go back one further, further cycle to 1618, where the first people were uh, significantly uh, uh, wiped out uh, with, with this. So these follow really set 100 year cycles. And I want you to remember this 100 year cycle because we're going to be looking into it in more detail very shortly. Now, uh, somebody asked yesterday, what's your view on uh, the, um, asked Bill Sarubi what his view was. And uh, Bill said that uh, um, I'd looked into it. But here's my view. Um, back in uh, 1918, the influenza, the Spanish flu pandemic lasted 27 months. I've done a lot of research into this. So if we were to project that same time cycle, that will take us into uh, round about Q2 of 2022. Now, but here's one thing though, this is an, a, re a really important point. And uh, uh, what happened in, 19, in the uh, Spanish flu pandemic was that people, had either died from the influenza or they developed herd immunity. Now, if we leave viruses to their natural life cycle, so viruses have life cycles, then they will fizzle out. And we are approaching that phase here with the Omicron virus variant. So this is exactly as planned. And uh, if you've been following my work, I forwarded uh, my readers back in early November that this was going to be happening, that we could expect uh, a quite a critical phase into December, but this would be the beginning of the end of the uh, virus. But I will say that there is a possibility that this could extend because we're getting a lot of intervention. And by that, I mean, and, uh, uh, is that we are seeing so many vaccines boosters, et cetera. And they are actually influencing, excuse the pun, you know, the, the, um, the, the virus cycle. So they could, this could actually unnaturally prolong the virus. Worst case scenario, the cholera pandemic was seven years. Best case is a year and uh, Spanish flu is 27 months. So I, I'm backing the 27 months because it's working uh, that, uh, working that pattern right now. But you know, if there's a lot of pharmaceutical intervention, it could uh, prolong it. Uh, I know it's a very contentious subject, but it was asked, and uh, that's my cycle's view on that. Now, 
I'll just show you this other one. This is an important cycle, the 18.6 year cycle, 18 year cycle. Again, it was talked about yesterday. Mr. Dewey, Edward Dewey identifies this very clearly. And this is why we got the trigger for a bigger event uh, last year and the year before, because this uh, we were getting these smaller viruses appearing. So basically, this was really identified December 2019, January 2020. But we could go back one virus cycle, uh, 18 years. Uh, we saw SARS in the Far East. We could go back another cycle and we saw AIDS, HIV as a significant issue in the very early 90s. And then we can go back to Hong Kong flu. And that was slightly out of balance. It wasn't quite in the 18 year cycle. But what happened here was that we got these lesser cycles acting as triggers for the bigger cycle. So just remember this cycle, we'll be looking at this one as well. So in 2019, we went on alert for a stock market top. So you can see all these are factors uh, building up to why we are at where we're at right now. In 2019, we were on alert for the stock market top. Why? Quite simply because there's a 90 year pattern uh, in markets without a shadow of a doubt. Let's take 1929. If we had back 90 years uh, from there, we get to 1839. 1837 to 1842 saw a huge panic based on the policies of Andrew Jackson and so on. And pro progressing this forward, then we knew to expect something in 2019. So what happened? Well, basically, uh, six weeks in, I think it's the 15th of February 2020, close enough for a 90 year cycle is six weeks. We saw the top and we saw a significant sell off, a sharp sell off, albeit short, into March 2020. So that was that. Uh, by the way, uh, we've just talked about midpoints. These are the midpoints there. 1884 there sees uh, um, a, a, a depression panic in America because a lot of gold is leaving America. 1974 sees the OPEC oil crisis and a significant low. So um, this is quite important. Uh, let's move on. In 2020, uh, we were looking at the year ahead and we put people on alert for a boom and bust. Why? Well, quite simply, we were 300 years on from the 1770 South Sea bubble. People in Britain were buying stocks in, in somewhat fraudulent companies based in the South Sea. Um, also, we saw um, the uh, in France, a guy called John Law uh, offered to assist the French monarchy uh, by effectively selling dubious land uh, in uh, this golden uh, place called New Orleans, which is swamp land, uh, you know, the Mississippi. Uh, and basically this was inflated and there was this massive boom and bust bubble as everybody got on board. We also had land panics in 1920 um, and 1820, and there were very big, big panics there. And, you know, um, you, you've got to read Phil Anderson's work there on the secret life of real estate and banking. The point is that these hundred year cycles were aligning with absolute clockwork. And what did we get? Well, first of all, we got the pandemic, the market crash all working together, i.e. arguably the market crash was due to the pandemic. Yet cryptocurrency takes off in a bubble. Uh, that's the 300. Uh, that's the first bubble, as it were. Grains took off because they hit the 50 year cycle, which is half of the 100 year cycle. So, again, we're talking half harmonics. And uh, that was the boom, uh, boom there and arguably the bust. And of course, we're, we're pretty much back to uh, some lows as we speak about Bitcoin today. So in 2021, last year, we talked about the potential destabilization of the United States of America and the loss of global status. Why? This was due entirely to this 250 year cycle. So this was the, you know, the same concept that we saw. Uh, and this time we're, we're rather than taking it back to the Stamp Act, which precipitated the revolution, we're taking it back to the 4th of July, 1776. So uh, these are the key cycles and they have all set the backdrop for what's going on in 2022. So the first thing and the highest on my list is this disruptive 82 to 84 year cycle, which we talked about in revolutions. We're also talking about it here in war cycles. OK, so uh, on the uh, 1st of September, 
1939, Hitler commenced hostilities against Poland, initiating the Second World War. And basically, we're just over uh, 82 years now from that horrific event. Very few nations remained um, neutral. But we can project this cycle back one further time span. And that takes us to 1853 to 1856 and the Crimean War, in which Russia lost to an alliance of France, the Ottoman Empire, which is now Turkey, the United Kingdom and Sardinia. And France, the Ottoman Empire and the United Kingdom were huge players. These were big global uh, dominant authorities. So you can see how this pattern fits in very, very clearly. And I want to take this one cycle back just to show you that, you know, the importance of these multiple returns. And it takes us to the American Revolutionary War, exactly the same thing. So we've got all these war cycles coming in and the window is open. It opened last year. We're really quite in the depth of it right now. And I'll show you at the very end another factor. Uh, and it really is open until 2024. So uh, be aware that there is potential for conflict. We're already seeing economic wars break out and it might well be just a huge economic conflict and a, a, just a, a rearrangement of uh, domination. But that is what we're seeing. So <clears throat> when we talk about the American Revolution, you know, the Revolutionary War, Britannia ruled the waves. Great Britain had the biggest navy and the greatest shipping. It was the biggest trading nation. And basically, it was all about this authority. Uh, and um, one of the key reasons for war, which comes from uh, a book called Breaking the Code of History by David Murrin. And, and I want you to watch this space because David Murrin uh, has been working with us at the foundation, has some very interesting information. Uh, so uh, uh, watch out for some very powerful interviews that are coming up. But he states one of the key reasons for war is to confront another power with the ultimate purpose of increasing territory and acquiring resources. So just bear that in mind to confront another power with the ultimate purpose of increasing territory and acquiring resources. OK, a very important point. So with that in mind. Let's have a look. We, we see this 250 year cycle. And uh, basically, we see that uh, last year, America, at very short notice, leaves Afghanistan. There's arguments about which, if, which administration is responsible. It doesn't matter who started the negotiations and who actioned what. The point is, America left this key strategic area of Afghanistan. And what has happened here? is that China has made tremendous inroads. Well, why is Afghanistan important? First of all, it contains a lot of rare earths and a lot of key minerals uh, and um, uh, commodities, uh, especially uh, relevant for what we're looking at in this electronic vehicle market, et cetera. But it also clears its pathway towards the Straits of Hormuz, which is this area here the most critical point for the shipping of oil from the Middle East. So China is now expanding down this uh, road, uh, roadway into Afghanistan as America leaves. A very important point. China is also uh, looking, it was mentioned yesterday, Bill talked about this, a degree of, of standoff, huge standoff there uh, between uh, uh, Taiwan, known as the Republic of China, and China itself. And uh, um, there's some interesting bits and pieces coming together. But most importantly, whilst um, Taiwan is not particularly rich in natural resources, uh, it is the world's uh, unmatched leader of the global semiconductor industry. Uh, TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, accounts for more than 50% of the global market. And that sector, the whole semiconductor market uh, well, sector, accounted uh, in 2020 for $115 billion of output. Uh, the next closest uh, rival to TSMC is Samsung, who are based in South Korea, and they're considerably smaller. But between the two of them, they pretty much control the world's, you know, the vast majority of the world's supply. So that's one of the factors, but then we can take this a bit further. You'll be uh, 
familiar with the fact that the United States prohibited companies that use American equipment or intellectual property from exporting products to many companies in China. This in turn uh, forced um, Taiwanese uh, semiconductor companies to stop doing business uh, with significant Chinese clients such as Huawei. So you can see there's a lot at stake here. And of course, one of the biggest issues right now is the supply chain issue. Uh, and that in itself is caused by the lack of semiconductors that are needed in aircraft, in cars, and pretty much all sorts of technology. And we just can't get enough of them. So, you know, this really, Taiwan therefore has a significant position in both the American and Chinese uh, supply chains. And really, this is the crux of the US-China trade war, uh, or at least one of them. And this is the big threat, because should Taiwan be properly annexed by China or, or, you know, or worse, then the global supply of semiconductors will be further threatened. And this would create a stranglehold on the world's economy. So, you know, as, as Murrin said, it's all about acquiring resources. So these are significant resources. And if that happens, um, what do you think the implications would be for the world stock market? So I'm just going to ask you that. Uh, so that uh, is a significant issue. And I'm going to explain the cycle behind this in a minute. Um, so stay with it. Uh, stay with me here. The other area is uh, over the last 18 months, we have seen China in a standoff with India uh, 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 over disputed border territories, including the Sikkim Valley. Uh, so let's bring in the 60 year cycle. Basically, October 1962. Uh, uh, the Sino-Indian War uh, broke out, 4,000 people died in that, and I suspect that we will be looking at this area, uh, you know, some sort of conflict uh, erupting this year because of the 60-year cycle being a very important cycle. Um, obviously, I haven't gone into the background of all these cycles, but <clears throat> this is very significant. Um, note also this October 1962 uh, date, because we'll be revisiting that shortly. So uh, the other thing that I've just, I haven't got enough information on this, but um, this is quite significant. It looks like China is supplying ballistic missiles now to Saudi Arabia. And uh, this is quite interesting because Saudi historically has been a customer of the United States uh, for um, armaments and also uh, Great Britain. So it's very much sided with the West. So this shows uh, a potential change in the dire uh, you know, direction in the making. And it's this revolution, you know, it's sending ripples through the Middle East where rival powers, um, Saudi and Iran, uh, you know, are very much in their old Cold War. And, you know, we mustn't forget that there are huge issues with regards to Iran and weapons. So this is adding an extra factor in the war cycles window. OK, so I uh, hope you're with me uh, so far. Um, <clears throat> So let's just bring up the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, One Belt, One Road. And this is part of Chinese policy that commenced in 2013. And <clears throat> basically what we see here is uh, it's like the old Silk Route, but basically China has chosen to invest in all these different countries and uh, you know, help with the infrastructure there by, by putting money in and, and resources uh, and in return gets access to a lot of key commodities and minerals. So this was the map, it's already outgrown it. And let's see what is happening next. This I think is really quite interesting. So uh, we're looking here at the Caribbean. It's uh, a new theater as far as I'm concerned. And on the 30th of November, 2021, Barbados, which really has been under British sovereignty, became a republic and uh, uh, we Brits, we left basically. And um, there were several cycles coming together for that, but that's beyond the scope of this uh, presentation. But what is going on in Barbados? Well, they are seeing a huge number of sporting facilities, including Christmas, uh, cricket stadiums, sports stadiums, and hotel complexes being developed rapidly. Well, if, you, if you've ever been there, you'll know it's a beautiful country and it's a, a very interesting uh, um, <clears throat> country. So. Uh, uh, you know, it's a great holiday destination. Who is funding this new development? None other than China. So they've already put $490 million into Barbados in over the last short term. But move uh, closer to um, uh, 
the, the center of the Caribbean and we see Jamaica. And what happened in November was that China announced it was building a $274 million ring road around Jamaica's second city, Montego Bay, which is just up here. Um, so, you know, China, as I say, is, is investing heavily in the infrastructure of these nations. And the Chinese ambassador to Jamaica, Tian Kui, spoke of greener development and told Jamaicans, in order to get rich, build roads first. So you can see what's going on here. And, uh, you know, uh, Barbados had already signed a, a memorandum of understanding with China prior to the outbreak uh, of the uh, COVID. But this is all now part of the Belt and Road Initiative. And, uh, you know, as the Belt and Road Initiative country members enjoy additional benefits in shipping and aviation and infrastructure, modern agriculture, etc. So here's the thing. Um, China is putting a lot of money into these things, but there are loans and the debts will have to be repaid to the paymaster. Um, so as China uh, increases its foothold within the Caribbean and the United States, the threats and challenges are getting much closer to physically, geographically to the United States. Why should we be concerned? Well, 60 year cycle coming in, all right? Back on uh, between the 16th to the 28th October 1962, the world watched with bated breath as the Cuban Missile Crisis unfolded. And quite simply, I mean, I, I remember, um, you know, what my mother uh, talking about this, saying that, you know, they really thought the world was going to end. And why? Well, basically, Russia was sending nuclear missiles to, uh, to be stationed in Cuba with an uh, easy deployment reach of America. And this was because the United States had deployed um, missiles in Italy. And they, and this really, this event was critical because it was the closest that the Cold War had ever come to escalating into nuclear conflict. You know, history often rhymes and sometimes repeats. So we're seeing this 60 year cycle. We're seeing October. That's also the time that we saw India and China get into conflict, the uh, Sino-Indian War. So, you know, um, it's quite interesting, this region here, Barbados is a big sugar producer, Jamaica. Uh, so there are commodities here at, at uh, I'd say risk, but they are certainly in the limelight. And when I was researching this, this is from uh, the Daily Mail, this chart, so full credit to them. Uh, I didn't realize how much Chinese investment uh, has gone into um, South America. In 2000, it was 12 billion. In 2020, it's 315 billion, up more than 25 fold. Well, look at this. So 25 and a half billion has gone into Brazil. OK, soya beans, coffee, you know, big industrial nation, aircraft producer, high tech industries. 12 and a, uh, 12, nearly 12 and a half billion into Argentina, including a nuclear reactor. 45 billion into Venezuela, a significant oil producer. So these, you know, China is really getting uh, around the world. So, and also China has now replaced the United States as the biggest supplier, uh, uh, <clears throat> as the biggest supplier for Brazil, Argentina, and Colombia. So this is a, a, an important thing. Why is all this happening? We're at the foundation for the study of cycles. Why is China in the ascendancy? It's the 100 year cycle. 2021 is the 100 year cycle from the foundation of the Communist Party. They are now moving to the next uh, level of their expansion. And uh, this is a, a really interesting situation that's developing here. So this is the big cycle that's in. We do see things happen at 100 years uh, very quickly. A little bit off piste, but you know, 1907 Rich Bands Panic, 1807 uh, Embargo Act Panic, uh, 1707 Crisis, hence Global Financial Crisis, 2007 8. So you can see the 100 year cycle works um, very, very clearly. Which other country is in the spotlight? Well, quite simply, uh, Russia under Vladimir Putin is. <coughs> um, uh, flexing its muscles at the moment. And uh, why? Well, we're looking at moving into Ukraine. They're looking at moving into Ukraine, amassing troops there. 
Why? Well, I think it's really just because um, uh, the Ukraine used to be part of the original Soviet Union. But here's the interesting thing. OK, the 30 year cycle, a very important cycle. So we talked about 90 year cycles earlier. Three thirties make a 90. Um, on the 24th of August 1991. So just, you know, just literally um, a handful of months back, um, 30 year cycle came in for the declaration of independence of Ukraine when the Ukrainian parliament <laughs> declared independence. So the 30 year cycle is in suggesting change. I'll just take a sip of water. So, but what else has come in? Well, the Russian Federation was formed on Christmas day, 1991. So we're 30 years in from that. Uh, there's that cycle there. Now, here's the really important thing. We talked about the Crimean War in the, um, <coughs> excuse me, in the um, global conflict cycles. This here is the Crimean Peninsula and it is part of Ukraine. So, you know, what we're seeing is that cr the Crimea um, uh, Peninsula is appearing in this 30 year cycle as well as this war cycle uh, pattern, if that makes sense. But also in 1922, the um, uh, Soviet Russia, along with Soviet Ukraine, Soviet Belarus and uh, Transcaucasian SFSR signed a treaty creating the USSR, merging all these four republics to form the Soviet Union as a country. So we're in the 100 year cycle this year and hence Russia is in the ascendancy as well as China. So Russia and China are flexing their muscles. Where is the United States? Well, we're in this 24, uh, 250 year transformation cycle, really from uh, the creation of America from the 4th of July and the, the run up to it. And it really is uh, uh, a kind of death and rebirth or a, a transformation cycle. And uh, it's presently weakened as a superpower. And this means that it's really left the way open uh, for others uh, to take advantage uh, of this situation. Basically, America's in its own revolution. And these, this sort of death and rebirth cycle really comes to a head in 2022. And um, they, I mean, th th these super long-term cycles have triggers and sub-triggers and sub-triggers, and they're very complex to study. But the long and short of it is that I think we can expect some sort of crisis in the second half of February. And, and this very much ties up with Biden as well. You know, is he going to be fit to um, to preside? Are they going to invoke the 25th Amendment? And I think we're going to see a degree of chaos as we get into February, March time, possibly into some quite heavy duty sort of uh, issues as we get into July. But I think by the end of the year, this should be uh, resolved. You know, what, what will happen if, if Biden um, is not fit to continue? Uh, you know, what's the chain of command there? Is it going to be effective? So, you know, this is what we need to look out for with America. And uh, um, the also 1992 saw the Rodney King beating in Los Angeles uh, by the LAPD. This led to a lot of unrest, civil unrest. Uh, that was, uh, I think, around about April 92. And uh, uh, basically, uh, I think we're going to see more civil unrest. And as we saw, you know, as we've seen over the last uh, couple of years, so it's because of these situations, America's become weakened and therefore uh, the superpowers like China and Russia are making these dominant chess moves. So uh, basically, uh, another thing that came up yesterday was uh, uh, the civil war cycles for America. So these are America's own internal war cycles. And uh, what we if we start off with this 82 to 84 year cycle again, as I say, it's plus or minus a year or two. And by the time, you know, uh, so when, once you can identify, it, you can see it. But if we start off with independence in 1776, one cycle on, I know this works out at 85 years, but it was brewing running up to it. The issues of the Civil War were very clearly within this tolerance and war broke out in 1861. We take this cycle one more rotation again, and we are in the thick of World War II. The next one pans out in Q3 to Q4 of 2027. Uh, and so I think there'll be some degree of uh, 
disharmony in the United States then. I think that's going to be quite a critical time period. So uh, uh, Bill, Bill mentioned that. I think somebody uh, yeah, yesterday and somebody asked about that. Finally, I uh, just um, really want to uh, uh, hone in on this. Uh, 2022 is 108 years from the 1914 outbreak of World War I. This represents three 36 cycles, or more importantly, six times 18 year cycles. So the importance of this 18 year cycle cannot be stressed. It's very important. It's a generation cycle, generational cycle. So uh, there we have it. Uh, we are heading into times of conflict. I suspect that the conflict is gonna be more economic than physical given the highly destructive nature of modern weapons. We don't want to see them being deployed, but the stage is set. Uh, so that is uh, the geopolitical outlook that I have uh, for you uh, uh, delivered as quickly as I could there. I know time is getting on, so uh, do we have any questions? Yes, we do. And uh, before, before we jump to that, uh, Andy, outstanding presentation, uh, certainly top of mind um, and critical as we uh, start this new year of 2022. Um, and I'm, I'm, I have my own questions, but I'll have to save them till later uh, for another time that, that we get to speak one to one. Certainly being here in Asia, uh, just across the border um, from, from some of those tension points, it'd be uh, uh, interesting to, to uh, learn more. And actually, uh, perhaps if we begin with the uh, question from Roland, um, which is focusing on the I mean, geopolitical risk, but what that means to investment opportunities or, or potential um, things that we need to kind of maybe mitigate uh, in the time ahead. Absolutely. OK, so uh, if we're going to be hardcore about it, uh, defence stocks uh, will be an area to look at. Um, depending on which geopolitical uh, plays play out, there are going to be shortages of certain commodities. The worst case scenario, I think, is that um, um, one of the things we saw, uh, I'm just sidetracking here, but relevant, Bob Prechter gave us uh, a fantastic Fibonacci cycle rundown that came out to 2021, suggesting some, you know, potential big turning point. Well, if, if we do find that uh, the supply of semiconductors is um, curtailed to the West, then that really is going to create some sort of uh, uh, stock market uh, implosion as well. But I think, um, you know, we're looking at uh, the availability of the resources to different nations. I think we're looking at uh, a commodity boom over the next few years anyway. We're in the 50 year cycle from the massive grain boom. Um, and also uh, uh, remember that the 90 year cycle overlays into the Great Depression and the, uh, the, the famine. So that's coming up that cycle. I don't know if we're going to get that. And, uh, you know, I don't want to start the discussion on global warming and global cooling, but so I suspect we're cooling rather than warming. In fact, I more than suspect, but there we go. Let's be contentious. Yes, well, a point, a contentious point, which I'm sure will be uh, supplemented with more research at our science summit uh, mid-year uh, work in progress and Ray Terms will be leading that. So actually a good segue for that, uh, for those who are interested in natural cycles and what they mean to, uh, to all of us, really, society and uh, the, the whole framework. Um, the additional question, which is uh, definitely topical for the majority of our American uh, audience, but but also I think people looking to the states as, as a power center um, and as some of those additional attention points you highlighted. So you have the leadership there, the midterm elections coming up. Uh, th the question is more about the wealth gap um, and the polarization in the states. So given that the US is likely going to maybe have a continuing volatility, what else can you share with us on that point? Okay, I'm not sure if I understand the question, but what I would say is that this huge polarity in wealth is what you see at revolutionary points. Uh, so the classic case being the, the 1848 revolutions across Europe, where the industrialists became super wealthy. They became, became the equivalent of the, uh, you know, the, the, the super wealthy billionaires right now <clears throat> who are deemed to be taking advantage of, you know, the, the less fortunate. So I think ultimately, um, you know, the whole timeline there moving out to 2027 in America does suggest there's going to be a lot more domestic conflict. And I think um, uh, that that is going to be a key issue because that that division is just accelerating, you know, isn't it really? You know, you, people's wealth 
some people's wealth is going up by millions in days, you know, and as we've seen with people like Musk is going up and down by tens of millions every minute or whatever. Uh, <clears throat> but once, uh, what right now everything's okay, because whilst the supply chains are somewhat restricted, people are generally getting food and getting enough. It's when these issues kick in, and I'd like to think in the modern day they won't uh, get this bad, but, you know, history does repeat, you know, and, you know, we never thought we'd see a run on the bank, and we, that's what we predicted for 2008, and that's exactly what we got in September at the Northern Rock. People were queuing up to get their money out. So I think when we get to that point, um, <clears throat> it will be very interesting, and uh, I, th I think there could be some... Uh, greater disharmony within America. Does that answer the question? I wasn't really sure what the question was there. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's a big picture open question. So, I mean, it was great that you took it in, in the place that you thought would be most important. Uh, maybe as a preface to that, the midterm elections. Right, right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that um, <clears throat> we will see uh, some, uh, some challenges, uh, really. You know, it's just, it's just the way it is, you know. And whilst America has its infighting going on, it means it, it's losing its uh, dominance um, in, um, um, you know, on the global stage at the moment. And if we could briefly hit on that point, Andy, uh, uh, a mutual uh, industry colleague, and I know friend of yours, uh, Mr. David Murren, uh, author of Breaking the Code, uh, we just ran a, a, an in-depth uh, one-hour interview, uh, him and myself, that'll be uh, published soon on, on uh, the Foundation Cycle TV. Uh, of course, a big part of that is the rise and fall of civilizations and, and his long-term view that there's a pivot, there's a shift um, happening you know, wh where the US has basically passed its best days economically and maybe geopolitically. Of course, it, that it's, not, it's not so doom and gloom, but it at least opens up the question, what next? Uh, well, any points you can share on that? Correct that. It might, it, it's not the end of days. It, it's a low. Remember, everything moves in cycles, yeah. so there will be the next move up. So I think um, this is uh, uh, is quite uh, <clears throat> quite an important point, but you know we are at that that point right, right now, and it's not like you know, I mean I just remember Britain in the early seventies when we had a three day week, power outages, power cuts, etc. But you know we recovered from that, so you know everything does sort of go up and down in cycles, but um, you know that's where we are right now. We are in this area of uh, of great change. Yeah, and and well framed at the end there so not the end of days and, and certainly you know rise and falls of civilizations that happened throughout history uh, maybe an opportunity to reinvent and to to basically uh compete in a different way but certainly as you say uh, tension points um ahead and and perhaps a pendulum uh, swing uh of of some sort i have here uh, just just received uh, the, the ray dalio latest book um on why nations succeed and fail. So building on a similar thesis as, as what we just discussed uh, with David Murren, uh, but this is kind of focusing also on wealth gap uh, data. It's quite extensive. Uh, so useful for, for maybe the foundation uh, members to consider um, in, in, in terms of this big question. And I just have um, a final question, Andy, from Elizabeth. Uh, a, a good question, because it's a question I had on my mind being where I am uh, on the doorstep um, of the East. If Taiwan is invaded by China, threatening global supply of semiconductors, would that trigger semiconductor stocks to skyrocket, while the rest of the tech stocks uh, be, and will the uh, the next, the rest of the tech stocks be negatively impacted? Well, I, well, I, I think I can answer the second part. The, the rest of the tech stocks will be negatively impacted, whichever happens, because either they won't have semiconductors, or they'll be too expensive. Um, so I, I don't know is the honest answer, uh, but I know uh, Bill Cerebi's expertise is in this area, so that's something we can maybe put to Bill. Um, I, um, as you know, I'm predominantly involved in commodity trading. Uh, so that, I think that's a good question, though. That's a, a very good question. Um, I don't know what to say, so I'll just say I don't know. Absolutely fine. And perhaps we can car park that for, for Bill if he's online and, and if we have time at the end, we'll maybe follow up on a future occasion. Uh, Mark's also, uh, I think we have a question from Mark and Roland. So Roland's asking, why is there no political will uh, to resist China in Europe and the US? Based on your cycles or maybe any, any general thoughts you might have. Okay, so let, let's, I, right, I can't answer that question directly, but what I can tell you 
Uh, and this was part of the first thing I said, is that we look at this from an apolitical arena um, and a neutral arena. Uh, so it's basically one, it, rather than calling them companies, if you call them stocks or commodities, it means some commodities are on the rise whilst others are declining. Some countries are on the rise whilst others are declining. And then the cycle change will shift and the cycle lengths are varying. And so you get this massive flow and that's what's going on. As to why uh, Europe, etc., I, I think everybody's too embroiled in their own uh, little uh, affairs, as it were, that are going on and um, managing their own people. And of course, the nature of social behavior has changed significantly where people are now uh, you know, able to just follow whatever they want to follow and and and, and they don't necessarily you know they will believe what they're told when they subscribe to the stories that they want to hear so there is more polarized bias and there's a greater interest in the, in the totally unimportant in my personal opinion you know in the nif naf and trivia and uh, um i i actually think um you know the, there's uh, a movie don't look up that's just come out which uh, isn't the best uh, uh movie but the points in it are just absolutely spot on and uh, social dilemma was a documentary showing the influence of uh, social media companies as well so uh, um yeah I agreed with you on that i just watched it on uh netflix a, a parody of sorts but it, it certainly has deep meaning deep meaning parody with uh, you know well that's it I've, go and watch it make your own minds up but basically people uh have greater independent thought and everybody believes they are right to some extent and that in itself is highly polarizing yes and it certainly forces us to ask kind of big questions on in in, in some of that um uh, change that that you're highlighting um and we have uh, additional questions in the time that we have we're going in a, into a little bit of an overrun but i think it's warranted given uh, the topics that we're discussing and the great content we've had in in day one and two uh, Mark's asking, does China appear based on cycles getting closer to the US with Brazil and Car uh, Caribbean for food and other resources and possible conflict with the US? What food shortages are expected, i.e. wheat, corn? What are your thoughts there? Right. So I, I think if we refer back to David Murren's quote, the acquisition of resources, you know, I think that's what it's all about. I don't think the nation wants conflict. It just wants resources and uh, resources to expand and fund its own growth. So, you know, the, um, I, I think that is the key point, is that it's all about expansion and being able to fuel your expansion and sustain it. So you remember there were issues with soybeans uh, in America uh, and China, you know, not that long ago. And uh, under the Trump administration, there were huge tariffs placed on, on soybeans. Well, you know, Brazil is a big producer of soybeans now. So they're looking for alternative sources of such um, um, uh, commodities, you know. So uh, uh, that that uh, is really what it's about, you know. Uh, and you know, Chinese policy is is always an economic subtle policy. You know, you, nations don't willingly exchange, um, engage in confrontational warfare. You know, the smarter ones don't. I mean, some do go off and just bomb here and there every now and then to make a point, but. That, that I think is history. I don't think there's any mileage in that. It's never succeeded. So, uh, and you know, it's not, we're, we're talking about China here, but you know, it's not the only nation, you know, Britain for years went, you know, we talked about imperialism, America was the same, Portugal, France, you know, Europe were great uh, imperialists. And so this is just history unfolding in these huge cycles. This 250 year cycle is huge. You know, there's. Uh, you know, the, the 82 to 85 year cycle is huge as well. So I think uh, um, um, that that is uh, a distinct possibility. You know. Great. And uh, a, a follow up kind of bottom line market question on uh, markets that might blow up, blow out, um, uh, specifically gold. Uh, so the question is, uh, uh, if I can, if I can read it. The bottom. Do we see a run uh, up for gold with conflicts on the horizon? I think it's possible. So this is a really interesting question. So I think some of the money that historically has gone into gold is now in cryptocurrencies. So um, that has taken some of the power out of gold. But I think we will see uh, a bull market in gold. 
Um, but I think we will see some degree of inflation and that then I think would be bullish for gold. And um, for, for followers of my work, we have a very strong turning point in mid-April, which I see as a, a significant uh, uh, marker to evaluate. I, I think that could be a significant low. Uh, but when we look right now um, at the uh, at things like commitment of traders data, you know, th there isn't a huge amount of strength suggesting a huge bull run at the moment. But I, I would certainly be, uh, uh, well, we are. Uh, looking to be bullish on gold quite soon in the next few weeks and months. Okay, and then just as we wrap up, Andy, it's been a, a great engagement, uh, both presentation and, and our discussion. Uh, th there are final, final questions. So I'm, I'm pushing the, the the line here, but but for good reason because I, I think everyone's keen to hear more. Um, Elizabeth is asking. Uh, actually, Elizabeth, um, I think you had answered that question on, on global warming or cooling. So so that's yeah. I that's think we're done. heading into sunspot <laughs> cycle 26, and um, I think it is uh, off the top of my head, and I think that's a cooling cycle. Great. And more to hear on that. Coincide with civil unrest as well. Yeah. Yes. And yes. And and uh, perhaps we can provide more research on that uh, uh, email website. And of course, the science summit coming up uh, mid year. Um, and then uh, more specifically on a, a, a real trending market. I mean, it's it's been a rocket mover this year. Uranium. Patrick's asking um, uranium cycles and the dependence uh, for the USA for uranium abroad. Does, does that touch on any of your work? Uranium's not something we look at in any great detail. And so I don't have a view on that. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll move on to, to then the, the final, final question. Doesn't China, from uh, Royston, so the previous one from, um, uh, was answered, uh, last one from Royston, doesn't China now have a massive internal problem uh, and it's collapsing property debt bubble with dramatic impact on developer supplies, customers, local authorities and income, what does that suggest for the cycle for China? Does it does it just get worse? Well, th that's definitely the case. From what we're hearing, is that there there are huge debt issues there, but equally the cycles I'm talking about are part of its greater plan of of you know acquiring and uh, acquiring resources. So you know, whilst whatever's going on internally uh, is one thing, that the the foreign policy is another, and that's really what we're addressing right now in this presentation. So perhaps a, a crisis opportunity. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think yes that there is some, some, uh, some. There are some issues there in China, and I think uh, you know, uh, Bill's presentation yesterday showed that uh, China could well be uh, uh, quite, quite uh, bullish towards the back end of this year. Yes, I think it was bullish for China and and perhaps bearish for Taiwan. I recall. Yeah, yeah. So uh, okay. Uh, great, Andy. Thank you so much. And and before we uh, we uh, wish you well and 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 thanks for a great presentation. I've got to say, outstanding tie. You've received uh, lots of positive feedback on that. Yeah, political cycles tie. There we go. <laughs> well, well chosen. Say, can we also get everybody to follow the foundation on social media, on LinkedIn, etc. And and also, if anybody wants to connect, uh, I know Bill Sarubi, Lars Fontina, and Dr. Richard Smith. Um, you know, we're all on various bits, so please do follow us. Uh, I do a lot of stuff on LinkedIn as well, so it would be great if you could just follow us. That would be great. Thank you very much for that shout out. Social media is, is a big part of our uh, awareness work. Andy's very active, so please follow us on FSC, but also look at each of the board members because th th they'll be sharing out uh, different insights as well. Um, and of course, Cycle TV and, and so much more that we'll be releasing this year. Thank you very much, uh, Andy.